Okay, first I'd like to thank the organizers. Uh, Seoul is really a wonderful city. I haven't been here for some time and really been enjoying it a lot. So thank you for, uh, for bringing it here. Um, I'm going to give a talk today on a rather different subject, at least from what I've talked about before. And I probably will raise more questions than answers, so I hope to have a few answers. Okay, so <clears throat> a half century ago, Bondi, Vanderberg, Metzner, and Sachs discovered the infinite dimensional BMS group. And I think there's an important lesson here that transcends all fields of physics. And that is, you should never have a last name without a clear initial. <laughs> Otherwise, you will go 50 years and you will be completely forgotten. But I'm, I'm trying to help a poor Mr. Vandenberg or Dr. Vandenberg um, be resuscitated. So um, <laughs> they discovered the infinite dimensional BMS group, which is the group of allowed diffeomorphisms that preserve some specified asymptotic structure in Minkowski space, divided by the group of trivial diffeomorphisms that acts trivially on the, the final data on, where's the pointer here? Ah, that acts trivially on the final data of uh, up here at Scry plus. And <clears throat> following BMS, I'm going to concentrate on the structure <coughs> at Scry plus and ignore the parallel structure that also exists at Scry minus. Now, up at Scry, Scry plus, <coughs> unlike at spatial infinity, there are infinitely many quantities that you can construct correspond to the infinitely many two spheres that sit up at Scry plus. There's only one conformal two sphere at spatial infinity. And since you have infinitely many objects to consider, it's natural that they're acted on by an infinite dimensional group. And BMS uh, made a proposal for that group known as the BMS group. Now, this is 50 years ago, and you would have expected that this group would play a central role in uh, the study of all scattering processes in Minkowski space. And indeed, it should even constrain not only gravity theories, which is where they developed it, but any theory which can be coupled to gravity. So for example, we know that any field theory that can be coupled to gravity must have a conserved stress tensor. And similarly, there should be consequences of the BMS group for all scattering processes in Minkowski space. Yet, uh, we've, we've heard very little about it. And a word on coordinates here. I am going to work in uh, retarded coordinates where V is a, a null coordinate on Scry plus, R is the radial direction, and I will uh, denote coordinates on the conformal two sphere by holomorphic coordinates Z and Z bar. So um, I'm going to stay away from technicalities here, and I'm going to leave off the very detailed 1 over R corrections to this story, which uh, or uh, that, that were very precisely, precisely discussed over a period of decades, mostly in the 60s and the 70s, and just try to give you an overview. And there are two types of generators of the BMS group. One is uh, the so-called super translations, which move the two sphere on Scry plus, but they do so in a way that depends on the actual transverse position on Scry plus. So there are infinitely many of them. And as a vector field, they look like this, plus order one over r corrections, which I'm not going to write out. Also, uh, there's something which is more or less to leading order in one over r is the Lorentz boosts, which leave a specific two sphere at scry plus fixed. And if we looked at this two sphere that leaves fixed, it actually, uh, SO31, which is SL2C, acts like the, the global, the Lorentz transformations act like the global conformal group on the two sphere at Scry plus. So already at this level, 
we see something that looks is starting to smell a little bit uh, like two-dimensional conformal field theory because we've got a two spheres sitting there on which the global conformal group um, is acting. Now, about three years ago, a really fascinating proposal was made um, by Barnick and Trousert. And their proposal was that the BMS group should not just be, should include not only the global conformal killing vectors of that asymptotic two sphere at scribe plus, but any solution of uh, the local conformal killing vector equation, including the infinitely many outside of SL2C that comprise the uh, um, local conformal group, the local two-dimensional conformal group. And if you go back and look at the original analysis of BMS, they don't include those things simply because they demand that all their diffeomorphisms, the BMS group is a subgroup of the diffeomorphism group, they simply demand that all their diffeomorphisms uh, are completely finite at infinity. So they simply threw out the infinite dimensional conformal group by hand, although locally, if you look at the structure that is being preserved, it is preserved by the, all the local conformal transformations. So I want to draw an analogy to, here to BPZ, which seems like a long time ago, but it was 20 years after BMS. Um, they famously considered all local, it's, it's, it's in fact the same equations they were analyzing, they considered all local conformal transformations of, of the S2. And they might have said, I don't want to think about transformations that blow up uh, at infinity or have singularities somewhere on the sphere, and they would have just had SL2C. And now there are many ways of understanding why this is the case, but we all know that it's an incredibly good idea to think about whole, how all these singular conformal transformations act on the sphere. So Barnick and Trousert proposed that we should also include these things, and then what we have is a symmetry which is generated by two Euclidean Verisoro algebras acting on the conformal two sphere at scry plus at infinity. And therefore, Minkowski scattering processes viewed in the right way should somehow be related to two dimensional conformal field theory, though at this point, uh, we don't really know what kind of representations should appear. And we'll see below that, in fact, this was, may have been partially already known in the form of a paper which seemed to be addressing a completely different uh, subject, but a paper by Weinberg a few years later after BMS um, talking about a soft graviton theorem. Now, um, in most of this talk, I'm not going to uh, talk directly about BMS, but I'm going to talk about a much simpler uh, toy problem. And the toy problem is what are the asymptotic, the first, there's two of them. The first is what are the asymptotic symmetries at scribe plus of electrodynamics with massless charged particles? Now, if you don't have any massless charged particles, then um, that constrains what kind of gate, the boundary conditions you should have allow on the gauge fields up here. And the symmetry group is the same at scribe plus as it is at spatial infinity. And the asymptotic symmetry group is just the familiar finite dimensional global U1 um, that, uh, that uh, generates charge rotations. But once you have massless charged particles, I use for red here the charge current. Um, you can have charge flux at infinity. There isn't one charge. There are infinitely many charges, depending on where we put the two sphere. And we would, we would uh, expect some kind of non-trivial group. So this is a question which is the exact analog of the question BMS asked in the 60s, but in a much simpler theory, uh, massless electrodynamics. And it's a question which seems to not really have been addressed. And there's a similar question, 
for uh, Yang Mills theory and the Coulomb phase, what is the group uh, that acts on the physical data here? And I want to stress here that these are non-trivial questions already at the classical level. BMS were purely classical. Of course, these groups become important when you quantize the theory. And in most of this talk, I'm just going to address this question uh, at, at the classical level. So some comments on this. First of all, this problem of is of its interest in its own right, independently of the connection to the BMS, though thinking about BMS motivated me personally. Uh, secondly, the notion of an asymptotic symmetry group is, of course, extremely useful. But what exactly you mean by it changes with every new uh, application. And so part of this problem is to say what exactly we mean by this asymptotic symmetry group. It can't act on a Hilbert space in this case because we don't have a Hilbert space at Scribe Plus. There's, there's infinitely many Hilbert spaces, one for each uh, different surface that ends up at Scribe Plus. They're not unitarily equivalent. So we have to say what we mean by asymptotic symmetry group. And part of the problem is to say what we want to do with it. And my point of view is that it should be useful. In other words, it should tell us relationships between physical quantities that we can measure that we didn't know about before. Um, and the conjecture is that this group is a Katz-Moody group um, based on the gauge group G associated with the Yang-Mills group. And I'll <laughs> discuss briefly the possibility that the le this has a non-zero level which is related to one over the square of the coupling constant. And this is a nice answer because, as I said, well, it's sort of the only group you could really, infinite dimensional group you could naturally associate. But also, uh, as I said, when we couple to gravity, we, we ha if Barnick and Trusert are right about the conformal group, we need some group that is going to couple nicely to gravity. And uh, Katz-Moody groups certainly do this. Now, this is a work in progress. Uh, my understanding of many points is, 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 is incomplete. And I'm presenting this in part. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping someone in, in the audience will have some, uh, some, something uh, I interesting to add. And I, to add, and I uh, welcome your input. Now, there's a very important clue, which was my second important um, motivation for, for this work which was something that was explained to me by uh, Maldacena a couple years ago. And he wrote a note on it, which he didn't publish, but he very kindly shared with me. And that is, if you take Weinberg's theorem, so what is Weinberg's theorem? Again, from the 60s. Weinberg wrote his theorem like this. We do some scattering amplitude uh, where we have outgoing charge po uh, particles, and then we do we add one soft photon. Uh, this operator represents a soft photon. We let its uh, momentum go to zero. And we find that that amplitude is related to the amplitude without the soft photon insertion by some factors which uh, involve the momentum. And he has a similar soft graviton theorem in the same paper. He doesn't do the. Um, the, the Yang-Mills case, but there's a, 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 a straightforward uh, generalization to the, the Yang-Mills theory. So what Juan noticed is you can take this formula and rewrite it in position space on the conformal sphere at Scribe plus. In other words, if you have a massless, and we're talking only about massless particles here, we could try to generalize to massive particles uh, Right now, it's hard enough to understand the massless case. So if you have a momentum of a massless particle, it lands at some point on that conformal two-sphere. So we can trade the momentum as a label for the position on the conformal two-sphere. And we can do some coordinate transformations and rewrite it that way. And lo and behold, if you do that and you rewrite, and again, you, you, you have to get the normalization exactly right, but you, you rewrite that, and you find that Weinberg's theorem takes the form of a ward identity for a U1 conformal Katz-Moody symmetry. 
So Weinberg's theorem, uh, as we'll see, can be thought of as the hard, useful consequence of these asymptotic symmetries in the case of, of um, uh, well, massless, now we'll go on to talk about uh, massless uh, QED. <coughs> now, mass, now, Weinberg was using the quantum language. I'm going to use uh, the classical uh, 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 language. So let's uh, now talk about massless QED. So again, if we have charge currents, which are, so the green represent all kinds of neutral stuff without charges. The red uh, indicates charged particles. And we see that, you know, if we measure the charge at infinity and then a charged particle comes out, this integral of the charge is going to depend on what value of retarded time we use. And by Maxwell's equation, we find that the time, the, the asymptotic time derivative, which I denote by V, V is the coordinate I remind you on square plus, is just equal to the flux of the matter charge current through square plus, which is going to be non-zero when we have charged particles. So now we want to do an asymptotic analysis of this problem and understand the asymptotic, uh, uh, fix the gauge and understand the, 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 the asymptotic properties. So one gauge to work in, though perhaps not the very best one, but it's what I've done so far, is so-called temporal gauge, where we uh, demand we fix AV equals zero, which is the same as AT equals zero if we transform to standard Minkowski coordinates. And we can also fix an initial surface gauge condition, which uh, that, that divergence of A initially is equal to zero using the V-independent gauge symmetry, residual gauge symmetry. And it turns out there's actually an obstruction to doing this if there are is charge flux coming through scry minus. So for now, I'm just going to, I, I want to ignore scry minus. So for now, I'm consider consider cases where there's no incoming charge on scry minus. There can still be uh, pairs of charged particles and charges going out to scry plus. So it's enough work to talk about scry plus. Now, <coughs> this condition, which is, for example, what's used in Bjorkane and Drell, um, has a residual gauge symmetry. And it's, uh, the residual gauge transformations are generated by these holomorphic functions. Now, of course, on the two-sphere at infinity, if we demand that things be globally defined, there's only one holomorphic function, the constant, and we don't learn anything very much interesting about it. However, there are plenty of functions, holomorphic functions, which are local on some region, which locally in some region on scry plus are holomorphic. And those symmetries we're going to see, and these are the exact analogs of the singular conformal transformations of the infinite dimensional conformal group. We're going to see that those symmetries, though we usually don't think about them, uh, have very interesting consequences. And we can think of the th gauge fields that are created by those, I'm going to call these large ga gauge transformations. And the gauge fields that were created, I'm going to call a boundary photons. They don't carry any momentum because they have uh, no, they don't depend on the coordinate, V coordinate on scry plus, but they do carry some angular momentum. And we're going to learn. Uh, something interesting from them. And I think in some sense we can regard them as the analog of the boundary, or I want to propose that we can analog, regard them as the analog of the boundary gravitons in ADS3. They're pure gauge, but they have interesting consequences and they live on the boundary of Minkowski space. I guess I already said this, and we're going to see that the, they, le they lead to something that to, to Weinberg's theorem. Okay, <clears throat> now I want to talk about the next step in the asymptotic analysis is to talk about the final data problem. 
This is, of course, what BMS did for gravity. This is a much simpler case than the gravitational case. And it's also, in recent studies of hol holography, we talk a lot about the Pfefferman-Gram expansion, where we start at the boundary of ADS, impose initial uh, conditions, and, and work in. So the, in, in this gauge I'm working in, it's natural to take the radial component of the gauge field to go like one over r squared and the z component going like r to the zero. This ensures that the charges are always finite. This allows for a finite energy flux uh, through scry plus, for example, plane waves are of this form. And now we just start expanding everything at sight in a one over r expansion. And as we'd expect, Maxwell's equations, the, the, the free data here is this zero component, the, the leading term of the zero component of the, the leading term of the gauge field, which is tangent to the conformal two sphere at infinity. So this A0 doesn't depend on R. Um, it's the first term in the expansion, and it lives at scry plus. And it turns out that once you know that that is the physical data at infinity, as we'd expect, it's complex, so it's two real degrees of freedom. That corresponds to the two spins of the photon. And once you fix that, the expansion of Maxwell's equation, well, if we have other matter, we have to worry about that too, but the expansion of Maxwell's equation then determines everything else in terms of this final data at infinity. So that's like the asymptotic data of, of some leading term of uh, some scalar field that we would we would talk about in in, in in ADS. So we specify that up here, and we can evolve backwards in time. Uh, so, for example, the radial component. If we look at the constraint equation here on scry plus, the leading term of the radial component can be written in terms of some double integral over the affine parameter v on scry plus of this AZ and its derivatives, together with a boundary condition back here, which I already specified when I said the thing was uh, divergence-free uh, back there. OK, now all of a sudden, this all looked incredibly simple, but now all of a sudden, it gets really interesting. So again, we want to consider the case where, um, just for simplicity, no initial charge, no final charge, we decay to the vacuum. And that means that up here at the future of scry plus, the gauge fields all vanish if the system is reversed to the vacuum. And now I want to find a to find a current JZZ, which lives up here, which in this problem is playing the role, this two sphere up here is playing the role of the holographic screen. Um, is minus 4 pi e squared times the f future value of this. Now, if you look at those equ constraint equations you wrote down, you find that this current here, given that everything is uh, decayed back to the vacuum, this current obeys dz bar jz is an integral over scry plus of uh, all the currents that have passed through scry plus. So let's, for simplicity, imagine that the current is just a bunch of point-like particle. The matter, the charge current is just a bunch of point-like particles, which pierce scry plus at retarded times vk at points zk on the two sphere. So I've drawn a slightly different picture here. This is the null coordinate of scry plus, and at each point there's a conformal two sphere. Coordinates are z and z bar. And each one of these charged currents pierces scry plus at a different point, zk, and we imagine that it carries total charge, qk. If that happens, then, I mean, this formula is, of course, completely general, but it, just to understand what this formula means, it says that d bar jz, the current up here has a delta function source at every point that has been pierced by a charge current no matter when it happened. So there's like an imprint 
of the charge current, if it even if it crosses scry plus at some finite time in the past, it leaves an imprint which persists all the way up to scry plus. And this final Jz obeys d bar Jz. It's equal to Qk over z minus zk, which is exactly what we would expect for a U1 current in a conformal uh, field theory. Okay, so this thing that I just gave is a rather different version uh, in, in a semi-classical limit, a rather different derivation of Weinberg's theorem. And I've set it up this way because this way of doing it is one that it's going to be much easier to uh, generalize to, 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 to gravity and so on. So if we do a semi-classical uh, uh, quantum uh, um, uh, version of this calculation, we've it, it's a statement that the insertion of this operator in some uh, amplitude uh, is equivalent to QK over Z minus ZK. And uh, that is just a rewriting in terms of position space on the sphere as shown by, by Juan of Weinberg's soft photon theorem. So Weinberg's soft photon theorem is the ward identity of the uh, Katz Moody symmetry associated with these uh, analytic meromorphic transformations of the gauge field on the two sphere at infinity. Five minutes. Wow. Okay. So, so Weinberg's theorem is the ward identity. I just said that. And moreover, if we take these insertions and we integrate them against some holomorphic sphere, epsilon of z, they generate the gauge transformations, these large gauge transformations on the uh, acting on these various insertions in the scattering amplitude. Now, there's also a hint here, though I won't dwell on this because there's some, some points I haven't understood about it. So this current itself, as we've defined it, is not gauge invariant. Uh, because it's AZ at the future of null infinity. So if your current, which is not gauge invariant, the coefficient of the violation of gauge invariance can be identified with the level of the Katz Moody symmetry. So we can compute that, and it works out to be uh, 2 over E squared. And indeed, the short distance two point function of these currents can also be computed in radiation gauge, uh, and we get this uh, 2 over E squared suggesting the possibility that this Katz Moody symmetry has a level k. However, the way I've set up the problem so far is hard to analyze this because it turns out that my gauge choice violated it, it, it is not invariant under the conformal symmetry. And there's some, consequently, some holomorphic subleading terms, which I don't understand. Um, and so that, that for now, uh, I'll just I'll just I'll just leave it at that. But there's a hint that this Katz Moody has a level. There's also a non-abelian version of this, which goes through in exactly the same way, um, and also a, a hint of a level at k equals two over g yang mill squared. Okay, now when we get to gravity, there's suddenly an explosion in the number of indices. Uh, but having seen our way through part of the story in the simple case of, of QED and Yang Mills theory, we can we can perhaps trace our way uh, through what the gravity story, and I'm kind of halfway through that. So here's what happens in gravity. This is a net, this is the analog of the. This of course was, of course the other thing about gravity, nobody ever paid attention to the asymptotic analysis of Scribe plus for QED or Yang Mills theory. But for gravity, there are thousands of papers on it, um, but uh, all in a different notation, of course. Um, but um, again, we have some asymptotic expansion in what's called Bondi coordinates. Um, and now we have four, not one constraint. And again, we find that if the system reverts to the vacuum at the far future, 
there's there's uh, some some special thing that happens, and the the thing that is important in the what I'm about to say is this coefficient here of the dz dv term of of the metric. Um, so all these coefficients I'm writing in expansion. So all this m, which is called the local bonding mass, the lapse, uh, and its subleading corrections to the lapse, and so on. They're all terms in this expansion. They depend on the coordinate square plus, but not on the radial coordinate r. Now, just like before, I'm going to define a current. So this, this is now really exactly like the electromagnetic case. I'm going to define a current, which is the asymptotic, uh, it's the boundary value at the future, and I'm working in Bondi coordinates in Bondi gauge, at the future of null infinity of the leading term of the lapse in the metric, the lapse function in the metric. And I've shown that in this region, this is related to the integral over the entire history of scribe plus of these two things. One of, one of which is the actual matter flux of energy through scribe plus. And I want to emphasize this. This is a formula at every value of z and z bar. I'm not doing an integral over a two sphere here. So it's something which is, this is a formula which is local on the conformal two sphere at infinity. So it, it, it involves the energy flux, matter energy flux, and also this term which is the gradient of some term, the V derivative of some term in the metric, which is known as the Bondi news. And it's well known that this is the term that accounts for the energy and gravitational radiation going through scribe plus. Unlike in QED, but like in the Yang-Mills theory, um, there there is also in gravity the field itself can carry energy through 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 scribe plus. And again, if we solve this, we find another uh, formula like this, which says that that P z is equal to the energy over z minus z k. And again, there's a semi-classical version of this, which um, uh, which also uh, is a limit of, 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 of Weinberg's uh, soft fo graviton theorem um, uh, and also insertions of these P contour integrals generate the holomorphic uh, super translations. And I'm trying to make similar construction uh, for the Verisauer generators of, of the extended BMS to kind of verify the the um, conjecture of of Barnick and Trussard that that all of these conformal transformations should be relevant, and I guess I'm just out of time, so let me just say that Scribe plus of Minkowski space has an interesting structure for both gauge gauge and gravity theories that we don't fully understand. And recent developments in holography, we have a new way of thinking about things, a new way of organizing a gravity and the boundary behavior in gravity. Wait, did I do that? Okay, so, uh, and, and, um, and perhaps recent developments in holography and in two-dimensional conform field theory might, might reveal new insights into this problem, which is now, now a half a century old. Thank you. Questions, comments? Yes. And it's very natural to ask, what is electric magnetic duality in this context? For a billion case, your framework is already perfect. And I guess a non-abelian case, one would have to add additional stuff. So theory enjoys such a duality. And in the related context um, of... What, one, one question at a time. Well, I'm trying to... I'm oh, okay. still leading to the question. So in the context where a 4D gauge theory is already known to be related to katz moody algebras, something nice happens. So gauge group G is replaced, of course, by the dual group, and the level is also inverted. So it behaves really like a coupling constant. So I think it could be another clue or 
justification for relating the level to the gauge company. So does it sound reasonable to you? Um, so I don't think, so in the case of massless QED, and um, I, I, I did think a little bit of, uh, about this problem and got confused and but then realized there were other things I was more confused about, so I, so I dropped it. But um, there is a sense in which if you started working through this, um, ah. well, it, there is a sense in which I can't, can I go? Yeah, oh, great. It, it, if you start working through the um, same discussion and you allow point-like magnetic charges, what you will find is that this QK, which is the electric charge, becomes re replaced by QK plus I BK plus I it, it just complexifies this, this formula here. But on the other hand, and I, I would defer to the experts on this, my understanding is, though perhaps the Argiers Douglas might at first look like a uh, counterexample to this statement, my understanding is that there aren't really theories which have both massless electric and masslic, massless magnetic uh, particles which can reach uh, scribe plus. And so it's a little awkward to talk about uh, duality in this, in this context. Yes? Uh, one can ask this related question which, uh, which brings the pictures that you're coming, uh, you're bringing out close to what we see in string theory, that is, you could ask, can we derive these soft uh, photon theorems or soft graviton theorems in the context of string worksheet theory? And in that context, uh, in the context of scattering of high energy uh, states of strings, like the computation that Gross and Mendy did, you'll end up, for example, of scattering on the sphere, which is similar to the, in fact, you think it's exactly the picture of the conformal sphere drawing, in which case the current algebra and all that is the pullback of the corresponding vertex operators for the graviton or gauge field to the vert to the worksheet of the string. And, and in particular, just if you take that analogy and if you can embed it in that case, it would suggest, for example, that the coupling is proportional to K but not equal to K, just like in string theory. So it so sounds somewhat related to some observation you're making. Yeah, that, that's a great question, Kurman. And I'm, 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 I'm glad you asked me. And I had a transparency on this, but it was just too speculative. So I, 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 I took it out. But now you've given me the license to, to, to say something about it. Um, so there, the way that these symmetries act is very similar to the way that the symmetries act on the world sheet in string theory. And one. It should be possible, I don't know how to do this, but it should be possible to rewrite um, usual Minkowski space S matrix in some kind of vertex operator formalism where you just have vertex operators which act on this uh, conformal sphere. And then of course, it looks just like what we're doing in string theory and in fact, there's a sense in which this conformal sphere looks like it wants to be the string world sheet. Now, and the way that these uh, symmetries are, are, are related to each other, and I, I don't know why anybody hasn't done this in, in string theory, but the, but the way that these symmetries relate scattering amplitudes and Weinberg's theorem is very similar to the way that we get relationships between scattering amplitudes, and if not identical, to the, relation, the relationship between, that you get between scattering amplitudes uh, in string theory by insertions of the world sheet katz moody current. So maybe what we're learning here is that quantum gravity is string theory. You know, it always has to be, it's like a dare, you know, it could be something like that. But then there's the formula for the level. So the formula, which 
um, I'm, a formula I'm not very confident of, obviously, but there's this formula which is k is equal to 2 over g yang mill squared. Now, there is a formula uh, which you can find in all the textbooks um, for the relationship between the level of the current algebra on the world sheet and the space-time coupling constant of the associated gauge group. So, of course, it's true in string theory that there's a Katz-Moody algebra for every space-time gauge symmetry. And the relationship between the level and the space-time coupling constant is not what I just quoted to you, but it's k, it's, it differs by a factor of g string squared. There's a g string squared in it. However, um, there are lots of discussions in various contexts where, where world sheet symmetries lift to space-time symmetries. And the closest one to this, to this, the closest analog of this is an old paper by Givion, Kuruzov, and Seiberg, where they take, they look at ADS3 times S3 in the nouveau Schwartz sector, where there's a nice world sheet, and they lift the SU2 current algebra to the space-time uh, SU2 gauge symmetry that you get in that compactification. And that formula, the relationship between the space-time level of the space-time gauge symmetry, the space-time current algebra, and the world sheet current algebra, has exactly a factor of g-string squared in it. So, so the hope would be that there would be some stringy derivation of this, where we could take the string world sheet and lift that Katz-Moody to the Katz-Moody that I'm talking, talking about here. Uh, last question. Um, do you expect uh, BMS transformations to be canonically generated, to have a canonical generator? Yeah, so, so Barnack and Tresor, of course, wrote a number of papers trying to write, well, well sorry, BM, okay. So the BMS group itself was discovered in 1962. And, and then there's a question of whether you can write down charges which generate the BMS algebra. And perhaps you know better than me, but my understanding of that is that there were many difficulties in trying to do this, all stemming from the fact that there isn't a natural Hilbert space up at Scry plus. Um, and that this was sort of a was, I think it was finally accomplished by Wald and Zupas something like 10 years ago. So it was 40 years between the algebra and the construction of the charges. It's a, it, they're not the same thing. It's very hard to go from one to the other. And um, I, I, um, and Barnack and Tressart tried to do the same thing for the extended BMS group that, that, that has all these other transformations uh, in it, but um, I've taken a different tact here. I, and they ran, they ran into some problems, there were some divergences, and I don't know if that program can be completed or not, but I'm setting things up in a, in a different way. I'm not, I'm not trying to construct charges that globally, you know, they don't, they don't, I don't think the charges naturally act on, um, they don't naturally act on R3 slices with S2 boundaries. And especially if you have a Katz-Moody algebra, it, you know, you need to get the central term, you need to have a circle somewhere. And so, so I, I, I'm setting it up in a rather different way, where you have currents and the charges generate gauge transformations on a portion of the sphere at scribe plus. So maybe there's some way of making sense of that, uh, but I, I just took a different angle and doing things this way, there's a more direct uh, uh, co connection with, with Weinberg's theorem and a lot of that was inspired by, by Juan's observation that this looks like a, a U1 uh, Ketsmudi algebra. Okay, so we are running out of time, so let's thank the speaker again.